tonight we're going to begin our series again of preaching through each book chapter by chapter. This will be week one, series one. This is obviously chapter number one of the book of Ruth. Now in, the, in uh, Ruth chapter number one, verse number one, in the very beginning we get the time of when this is t taking place. The background of the story, if you will. Chapter number one, verse number one says, says right in the beginning, now it came to pass in the days when the judges Rule. Now keep your hand here. Let's go over to Acts chapter number 13, verse number 20. Acts chapter number 13, verse number 20. We can get a, we get a reference to this in Acts chapter number 13, verse number 20 of how long the judges ruled. How long the judges ruled. All those that are familiar with the chronology of the nation of Israel, we know that Abraham is the first person who God came to when he established his covenant with him that he would make of him a great nation. The physical nation of Israel was birthed after that. Of course, he had Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob had the 12 sons, of course, the 12 patriarchs. Joseph going down into Egypt. They were in Egypt for many years. I can't remember exactly. Just slip me. What is it, 400 years that they were in Egypt? I believe it was. Not, not to the day. There's something to the day. I can't remember. Does anybody remember? 430. 430. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is exactly. I was confused now with this. This is 450 years that the judges ruled. So it's 430 years, it says, to the day. So they were in Egypt for 430 years to the day. They were brought out, and then they wandered in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. Once they, After they had completed that time because of their disobedience, they inherited the promised land. And when they inherited the promised land, they came into the promised land, and God divided slowly and bit by bit the land to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, at that time, God instituted his perfect ideal government, which is not a democracy, it's not a republic, it's not a de democratic republic, it's not, you know, it, what it is is, it's not communism, it is God being the ruler where God sets judges up. It is a theocracy where God is the king. When they end up, uh, uh, you know, re uh, rejecting this system, of government, God tells them that they are rejecting him from being their king. He gives them the laws and they set up judges that will help enforce these laws. Now that period of time, according to Acts chapter number 13, look at verse number 20, tells us that it lasted for 450 years. Look there at verse number 20, it says, And after that he gave unto them, referring to God, judges about the space of 400 years. And 50 years. And then it says, until Samuel the prophet. So go back to Ruth chapter number 4 now. Ruth chapter number 4. So we know when Samuel the prophet lived and when Samuel the prophet prophesied, immediately after the book of Ruth, you have 1 Samuel. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but the Old Testament is in chronological order. But it is broken down into categories and within those categories, then it is in chronological order. You have certain books that are poetic books. Those books are in chronological order. You have Job, Psalms, Proverbs. You know, Job came first, Psalms is David, then David's son is Solomon, then Proverbs after that. When you look here in, in the first book of Samuel, which is right after, you don't need to turn there, it's just right after the book of Ruth, this is in chronological order as well. So you have Judges... You have the book of Ruth, which takes place during the time of Judges, but it's at the very end of the Judges. Now look at Ruth chapter number 4, verse number 17. It says, And the woman, her, and, and the woman her neighbors gave it a name, saying, And the women her neighbors gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and this was a grandson, of course, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Now Perez was the son of Judah. So now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram and Ram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. So really, when you look at the timeline of when Ruth takes place, it's very interesting because you may never have thought about this before, but Ruth was actually alive at, you know, as far as generations go, if you will, about two generations away from Saul, King Saul. Because if you think about this, David lived at the time of Jonathan, right? They're about the same generation. They were friends. And Jonathan's father was Saul. So Saul would have been of the same generation as Jesse. Right? Which is David's father, as Jesse. So if we look down there, we see Jesse 
is the son of Obed, who is the son of Boaz. And Boaz is actually who ends up marrying Ruth, who is of the same age of Ruth. So Boaz is, and you would assume so, I mean, Boaz may have been a little bit older. That would make sense as far as when we look at the kinsmen and everything and the relationship. But even still, Ruth then is of the same generation as it would be um, of Saul. It would, she would be uh, two generations away from Saul. That's what she would be. She would be two generations away from Saul if you were to compare David and them. So that's very interesting. It's only just, it's at the tail end of the time of the judges, just right at the very end. Samuel's even, I'm sure, alive at this point because if you think of Eli was before Samuel and Samuel was just a child when he went to Eli, Eli was probably the exact same age or right around the exact same age as Naomi or at least in between that of Naomi and Ruth right around that time. So it's very interesting. It's at the very end of the time of the judges. So you can really get a timeline going. It's very possible, depending on how long that they lived, it's very possible that Ruth would have been alive uh, you know, at the time of even Saul, probably. That's very possible. If she would have lived a long life because she was a little bit younger, maybe she lived to be 80, 90 years old. You know, she could have been alive at the same time of, of Saul, even maybe, you know, possibly if she would have lived to 90 years old, if you do generations by 35 years. It would have been really close to Saul being born, you know, and then maybe 10 years old when she would have died. So that's interesting to find out where this takes place if you lay it out on a chart. Go back to Ruth chapter number one, so that gives you the background of when this actually took place. So it's in when the time it says the time when the judges ruled. Begin reading after that statement. There was it says that there was a famine in the land. So at this time there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now, what does the word sojourn mean? Is it everyone familiar with the word sojourn? It means to stay somewhere, but it means to stay there temporarily. It's not meant to be permanent. He's not relocating there permanently. He's only relocating there temporarily. He's only going there for a short period of time. And what's the reason why he's leaving? What does it say? Because there was a famine in the land. Now, let me ask you this question. Was it the will of God for the nation of Israel to inhabit the lands of the Moabites? Was it the will of God for them to live in the lands of the Moabites? It was not, was it? Actually, the Moabites, if you're familiar, you know, I didn't take any, any, any notes about this, but if you're familiar with where the Moabites come from, is everybody familiar with where the Moabites came from? It's, it's of the uh, incestual relationship of Lot and his first daughter. And then the second daughter is where the Ammonites came from. And the, the mountain Ar, the land Ar, the land Ar is the land that the Moabites actually inhabit. And God told them that they were not to fight with the Moabites when they came through. They weren't supposed to fight with them. They weren't supposed to fight with the Ammonites. They did not live directly in the land of Canaan. They lived on the outskirts of that land. And they were supposed to stay away from them. They were supposed to stay away from them, and they weren't going to take their land. They just weren't supposed to be around them, right? Now, continue reading there. It says, And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. And it says, He and his wife and his two sons. Verse number two, And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilion. See, a lot of people, let me just throw this out there as far as pronunciation when you're reading in, in the Bible. A lot of these things as far as when we read them in light of English, you would think that you would pronounce that with the hard ch sound, but it's like uh, the word Chaldean, if you're familiar with that. A very rare exception of this, uh, of CH making the ka sound when you're reading in the Old Testament, is cherubims. Most of the words that have a CH that begin with a CH, I mean 95% of the time, it's going to be a cuh sound, like, you know, like Chaldean. So this is Kilion is actually how you pronounce that. So Kilion, and it says Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. It says, and they came into the country of Moab. Now watch how it words this. It says, and continued there. Now the word continued, what does that imply? It means that there was a time when they were going to leave, or there was, time when, there was a time when it was going to end, and then they continued. You understand what I'm saying? In order to continue, there had to be something, you had to have went there, a period of time went by, and then it continued. And what did it just tell you that the purpose of why they went there was? Famine, Famine right, but how long were they going to go? They were going to go there to sojourn. And then it says they continued there. So what is the Bible telling you right here? 
They went there to sojourn, but they continued there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they moved there to the land of the Moabites, and then they stayed there. They actually stayed in the land. Now, do you think, is it God's will? One more time, let me repeat this, because we're going to get into this in a moment. It's going to become very pertinent to what we speak of here and of this chapter. Is it God's will for them to go to the land of the Moabites? No, it is not. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7 real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 7. God had very strict laws, very strict rules for the nation of Israel. And when he, when he established the nation of Israel, per, or, or formally, let me say, and he actually took them and planted them into their land, he had very strict rules stay away from the heathen. Now, let me say this real quickly. Um, let me say this. People are very confused about what a Jew is and what it really means to be Jewish or what it means to be of the nation of Israel, even in light of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, those that were a part of the physical nation of Israel, it did not mean that you had to be a physical descendant of Abraham. That is, that is not true. A lot of people are under that impression, and that is not true. At the end of the book of Esther, the Bible tells you, this, this alone debunks that, that there were many that became Jews. That alone, that, it's, it's, it, there's no more arguing about that. If somebody, that's, you know, it, without controversy, right? It's not debatable. They became Jews. Right. So you can become a Jew. At, at, uh, in, at the very end of the book of Ezekiel, when they're reestablishing the temple, he reiterates the laws of the Old Testament. And he talks about how someone of another nation can come in and you are to treat them exactly the same. If a stranger comes in and they marry a, a, you know, a, Jew, a Jewish woman, if you will, they are to inherit in her land. They are to be given land. You know, even if a guy comes in and he actually converts and he becomes a Jew and he's worshiping the Lord, obviously they have to follow the commandments. They have to go by the laws of the land. They're, they're, given, you know, they're given land. They're given an inheritance you know, I, I believe it's of whichever one they choose. I can't remember exactly, but there's a stipulation, and they're given a land, and they are just mixed in. No one knows where they go. You know, no one has any idea. I mean, they're, they have a genealogy. They can marry. No, it's not a race. It's a nationality. It's just like this. You have the United States of America, and you have Mexico. Those are two countries. Those are two nations, right? In the United States of America, you have people that are of European descent, Correct? You have European descent. That would be your ethnicity. That is not your nationality. That is your ethnicity. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? So I am of European descent. Okay? My, that's my, that is my, uh, you know, ethnicity. Okay? Those of Mexico, a lot of them, you know, will have, you know, a, a uh, they would have a Spanish descent, really. Back to Spain. So... If those, someone from Mexico wanted to become American, wanted to, to become, you know, an American, they would just be, they wouldn't be, their ethnicity would not be changing. They would just be coming a part of our country. It's that simple in the Bible. That's what takes place in the Bible. There are laws, and a Jew is someone that is of the nation of Israel. That's all that it is. An Israelite is someone that is of the nation of Israel. And you can see all throughout the Bible, you can see all throughout the Bible, that's perfect. You read my mind. Uh, you can see all throughout the Bible where people are becoming Jews. It won't use that statement, they became a Jew. But we're going to see here an example of that with Ruth, where she just comes in, and she is actually, she's actually a, uh, Jesus is, you know, comes of the line of Ruth and Boaz, ultimately. And, uh, you know, but let's look here, let's focus here at uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 7. Verse uh, number 1 we'll read. Let's get back on subject here. Chapter number 7, verse number 1 says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into la the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. So these are all the nations that inhabit the land of Canaan. So like I said, Moab is around, is around that land. It says in verse 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show, them, not show mercy unto them. Verse 3, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter, thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Now verse 4 is the key. This is why. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. 
so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So we can see that God actually has laws implemented where he says that you are not you are to kill everyone that inhabits that land. And when you get there, and, you know, he gives like basically, you know, this this backup law, right? And he says basically he gives like this precautionary, obviously, a plan B if, if you don't kill everybody. He tells them, like, no one's supposed to get married. You understand? Like, if anyone's left, don't marry anyone. So that's the backup, obviously, there. If, if there's anyone that's not killed, they're not supposed, your, the Israelites are not supposed to marry them. Okay? Now, w the reason why they weren't supposed to marry them was because the nation of Israel was to be a peculiar people unto God. And like that, you have to keep in mind that people could become a Jew. Now, if there was a Moabite, who converted, right, and started worshiping the one and only true God and converted and became a Jew, there would be no problem with them marrying, someone marrying, you know, whoever this, this, this woman or this man, man was. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? The warning here is to those who what? Who serve other gods. That's why they're supposed to stay away from those, those lands. So when you go back to Ruth chapter number one, there's no, there is no implication that, you know, Elimelech should have taken his family and left because there was a famine. And actually, when you look up the, the, the other two times that that happens in the Bible, the first time, very interesting, is Genesis chapter number 12. And if you're familiar with what that, that chapter is about, that is when Abraham, God first comes to Abraham and he tells him to go to the land, right? He's going to take him to the land. He goes to the land. He's there. He builds the altar. And then guess what happens? A famine occurs, and he runs away, and he leaves. Now, what was God's will? He went and sojourned in that land. God doesn't explain specifically. He says, I'm going to give it to you and under your seed. God doesn't give him details of how this is going to work out, right? God never tells him, like, it's going to be a while until your seed actually, physical seed actually inherits it. And obviously, there's the spiritual application of it being New Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that in the New Testament, that he looked for a city whose, uh, you know, whose buildings and foundations you know, were made, it was made of God. But when he, when he leaves, he was never commanded to leave. And you know, what, you know where he goes is Egypt. Did everyone know what Egypt is a picture of in the Bible? It's a picture of the world. As soon as he get there, gets there, you know what he does? He sins. He lies and he says that Sarah is you know, his, his sister and, and not his wife. He wasn't supposed to leave because there was a famine. Did, you know, notice that it's Elimelech that's leaving because of the famine. So what is he putting first when, when this takes place? What would he be putting first? What would you think of when we think of food? What is that? It would be like finances, right? He's putting like the finances of his family as the priority. Now, I want you to flip over, look at the end of, we're going to look at this in a moment. We'll look at it now because it, it's relevant to what we're talking about. Look at verse 21. Look what she says. Ruth chapter number 1, verse number 21. She says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Now, notice that. So does it sound like they were just like dying when they left? No. She said, I went out full. Now, I'm sure she's also referring to her family because her family ends up perishing and dying also as well. But I'm sure that's not the only thing she's, that she's referring to. They left because of the famine. And I would almost guarantee that it's probably because they were putting their finances first. It's probably because, hey, because here's the thing. God, you know, even when we're put into a tough situation, you still need to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. You don't need to lean upon your own understanding. God gave them that land. God gave them that land at that time for them to live in and for them to dwell in and for them to be a, a peculiar people. And hey, you know what? A lot of the time when there was a famine coming, do you know what the reason why there was a famine? is because God was sending judgment upon them. You know the reason why there was, a, there was a famine when Elijah was there? It's because there was you know, all the wickedness that was going on with Ahab and Jezebel. That's why there was a famine. So it could have been because of the wickedness of the nation itself. But that does not mean run and hide from your problems. That doesn't mean leave the land that God promised to give unto your ancestors, promised to give unto you know, that specific nation at that time that they would inherit that. And where they have the laws of God, where they have the temple or the tabernacle at that time, they're running from the tabernacle and leaving the congregation of God, leaving the people of God, and then they're leaving and they're going to live where? With the heathen. They're leaving and they're going to live with those that are serving and worshiping false gods. So there is, when we look in, in verse number one, verse number two, you can read over this sometimes, but there is no implication that they should have been leaving. 
There is no, there, there is no reason why they should have been leaving. And actually, we'll, we'll see that the result of them leaving was not good. Look at verse number 3, what it says next. And Elimelech, Na Na Naomi's husband died, and she was left, and her two sons. And look at verse 4. It says, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. Notice when that took place. What happened right before that? The husband died. Who is what? The leader of the family. The husband who is the one that is always the one that enforces the laws in the family. He's always the one that's overlooking the family, making sure everyone's doing what they should be doing. He's the overseer, right? He's the one that, that is, should be the primary disciplinary in the home. And as soon as he's out of the picture, what do they do? You notice that? So he takes his family into a foreign land because he's putting finances first, probably. Whatever reason, he's still not trusting God. Even if he was, you know, didn't have that much finances, did start, you know, losing money and was afraid that he wasn't going to have enough. He still doubted God's promises. He still left the land that was promised and given to him. And he disobeyed God and went and lived among the heathen. He brought his family there. And then he died. And as a result of him not being around anymore and putting his family into a position that they shouldn't have been in in the first place, his, his um, sons both married Moabite women. Now, you don't know how that could turn out. They could possibly convert to serving and worshiping the one and only true God. But what's the warning? God gives a warning for a reason. The warning is don't marry them. Because they could turn your heart away. Is it going to happen every single time? Yeah, let's not take chances, though. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Let's not take chances, because you don't know what's going to happen. Right? So, look at the position. Look at, like, what, a, what the, the leader of the home. You see the importance and the significance of the choices that you make as a father, as a husband for your family, and how it could turn out. Because you have no idea what, what direction this could go in. You could die. You could make a bad decision. He could have died, passed away, left his family there. His wife married some heathen, remarried some heathen, and his two sons married heathen. They mixed in with the Moabites and just had, you know, and obviously the end of their life would have been destruction. They wouldn't have been serving the Lord. They would have been abounding in sin. You know, it would have been a sad sight if he would have been able to be resurrected and see that. You should understand, you see the significance of the choices as the leader of the home of what... You know, great effect that they could have upon your family. So notice it says, verse 4, and, so that's a conjunction, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. So does it sound like they're sojourning? So they continued there, but then in addition to that, it says they dwelled there for about ten years. So this is now, if you, you, you uh, keep in mind, Elimelech died. So now this is just Naomi. And then it's, it's now her two sons who are married to two Moab, Moabitish women, two women of Moab. And it says in verse number five, and Malon and Kilion died also. So both of her sons, it says both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So now her husband and her sons are both taken for her. Let me ask you this question. Does it sound like they're being blessed by God? No. Doesn't this seem like too big of a coincidence? Her husband dies, and you don't know how long they were there. It says they continued there. Maybe two years, maybe three years. I believe it's probably less than ten years because that's why it doesn't tell you. It was, uh, ten years is a significant amount of time. It's a decade, so it tells you they were there ten years. Probably two, three years, and then another ten years. So 12, 13 years just to guess. At least 11 years, I'd say. At least. I'm sure the first period of time is at least a year. 11 years, they're away from their home. And you see, just within this period of time, she loses her husband and both of her sons. That's not a coincidence, my friend. When God promises that, that they're going to give them that land and, then, and, to, and they have co covenants and they enter into that covenant with God and they promise that they're not going to let their children marry the heathen, they're not going to live among the heathen. And why? And the Bible in the New Testament says the exact same thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're told, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath, uh, you know, uh, for what fellowship hath, I just lost it, man. What is, how's that verse going? Anybody else got it? Righteousness. righteousness with unrighteousness. I kept wanting to say darkness because that's the next part. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? So we're not supposed to be around the heathen. 
We're not supposed to, you know, to be embracing the cultures, embracing the practices. We're not supposed to be spending time and, you know, being buddy-buddy and being friends with those that are not Christians. Now, I mean, now obviously we have to go to work. We have to do those types of things. You know, and we today are not in a, you know, we don't live in a particular nation that was founded by God. The nation that we live in today is not where, we're, where God is our king like it was at that time. And he, you know, wrote on tablets with his own hand the commandments and gave it to, you know, the judge, which would have been Moses at that time. And that was passed down. That's not our situation. You know, in the New Testament, you know, it's, it's a nation made up of all kindreds and peoples and tongues and nations. All of us. And you know, when Jesus prays, you know, he says, we can't be taken out of the world, but that you would keep us from the world, right? So we have to go to work. We have to do, do those things. But we shouldn't unnecessarily, we shouldn't just yoke up with and, be, and create these strong relationships or just these relationships in general with those that are not saved, with those that are not the people of God. Right. And that's exactly what we see going on here in the Old Testament. Another example of that, which I, I you know, I'm not down on them right now as far as, like, I'm not saying that they're just like these unsaved heathens. The reason why I'm saying that this is wrong, that they did this, was because I, they probably were saved. They probably, I'm sure, were people of God. And they were at least of the nation of Israel at this time. Everyone understand what I'm saying? That's the whole reason why they should have stayed away from the heathen. That's the whole reason why. Now look at verse number, verse number 6. It says this, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For me, because she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So the famine is over, is what she's saying. So verse number 6, continue reading there, says, uh, verse 7 now, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, so where she was dwelling in the nation of Moab, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So they're, so they're heading to Judah. It says, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to, to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt as ye have dealt with the dead, referring to her sons, with the dead and with me. Verse 9, The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. So she's saying, she's basically saying that I, I'm hoping, I'm wishing that you can go and that you can find a new husband is what she's saying. That you can go and find a new husband and find rest in your husband. She's telling her, you don't need to come with me. You don't need to follow me to the land of Judah. It says there in verse 9, Then she kissed, kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. So you have to think, I mean, She's been living and spending time with them for 10 years at least. And now, and you know, her, her sons have died. And now, you know, she's telling them goodbye. She's telling them, hey, I, you know, you need to leave. It's not best for you. She's trying to give them advice at this point and say, it's not best for you to stay with me. Go and get remarried. You know, you don't need to follow me around. You know, and they lift up their voice and they wept. So you can see that this is a moment of sadness. Verse number 10, it says, and they said unto her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So both of them respond and say, surely, you know, we're going to go with you and we're going to go with you into the land of Judah. So they had never been to the land of Judah. Verse 11, and Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? So notice she calls her my daughters. This is very common practice at that time. And all throughout, you know, the Bible will see that daughters-in-law in law will be referred to as daughters. And sons-in-law will be referred to as sons. So you can see she refers to her as her own daughters. She said, why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Verse 12, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, she's saying, so if perhaps I say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, and should also bear sons, verse 13, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? So she's saying, what if, you know, let's say that there was hope. Let's say even today, if I had a husband and I conceived right now, tonight, she says, would you tarry for them for nine months? And then until they're grown for another however long, 17, 18 years until they're grown so that you can marry my son. You can see that they, even that practice of what they would do in the nation of Israel oftentimes when they would marry uh, the closest to Ken, that even the Moabites here, the two Moabitish women, that they obviously embraced the practices of the Israelites. Because you can see she's speaking to them casually like, would you do that even if I had a child now? Which this is an, a practice of the Israelites. That's what they would do in their culture. And that's actually commanded in, in the law. 
So she's saying, you know, it's going to be 20 years almost until you can marry my sons if you wanted to just stay with me. Saying, she's basically saying, don't waste your life. Just go find someone. Just go marry someone. You don't need to waste your life, you know, caring for me. Right? Verse number 13. Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? So should, would you keep yourself from having another husband just for those 20 years to marry my children? If, if, if peradventure she were to have children? She says, nay, my daughters. So no, no, nay, my daughters. For it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So notice what, what Naomi says. What does she think is going, think, what does she think is going on in her life? She even looks. So we read this, and it looks an awful lot like the judgment of God, doesn't it? And then what do we see Naomi saying? The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She's saying that she's being punished by God. That's what she's saying. Look at verse number 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her, mo her mother-in-law. And then it says this, but Ruth claimed unto her. So the contrast there, when it says Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, that's like a kiss goodbye. She's leaving. She's going to go back to Moab. And then it says, but Ruth clave unto her. Clave means it's like stick. Like if so, cleave is the present tense to stick. You know, clave there is saying like she's sticking to her. It's the past tense of cleave. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So she's speaking of Orpah there. Verse 16, and Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee. And entreat means to ask. So she's telling her, don't even ask me to leave thee. No, in, you know, entreat me not to leave thee. Don't ask me to leave thee. Or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, so she's saying, for where you go, I will go. And where thou lodgest, that means like where you stay, where you sleep. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And then here's the key. And thy God, my God. So you see, when she tells her to go back to the Moabites, just a mo moment ago, when she's speaking unto Orpah and unto Ruth, what does she identify their people with? Their gods, right? So she says, go back unto, you know, your sister or your, your uh, sister-in-law is going back unto her people and unto her gods. So notice that the connection is close between the people and the gods. What did God say? He doesn't want them to mix among the heathen and among the people. Why? Because they'll start serving their gods. And when, 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 here we see Ruth identifying herself with the Israelites and with Naomi, what is she specifically identifying herself with? Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And this is not insincere. This is not something just because she wants to go along with it because she loves Naomi. Because I want you to notice the next statement. Verse number 17, she says, Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. Now watch this. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught, if aught but death part thee and me. So notice first, I want to point out, she just makes this casual statement, and she says, Jehovah, the Lord do so to me also. Or she says, the Lord do so, which, where am I at? I lost my spot. The Lord do so to me and more also. I knew I was missing a word. The Lord do so to me and more also. So notice how she just like casually makes like this covenant or this vow. So you can notice this is just her speech. So she worships the Lord. She says, the Lord do so to me and more also. You, you notice what I'm saying? She's not trying to persuade her, hey, I want to come and worship the God, you know, your God because you worship him, or just because it's of your people. She's already worshiping the Lord. She's already saying, man, making a covenant and making a vow with the Lord right here and saying, hey, if I don't come with you, if anything but death causes us to part from one another, causes me to not be with you, other than anything other than death, then the Lord can just go ahead and kill me. If I leave and go back, I'm making a vow now that I'm not going to leave you. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? So she's not just saying this just to go along with Naomi. She's worshiping the Lord. She's casually just making a statement about how she's making a vow to the Lord. So she says there, uh, verse 18, when she saw, it's referring to Naomi, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, so steadfast, you know, meaning that she's for sure going to go, right? She's, she's for sure going to go. She's confident. There's nothing that's going to change her mind. It's unmovable is what the Bible uses, interchangeable for steadfast. So she's steadfastly minded to go with her. Then she left speaking under her. Now I want to stop here and I want to show you something you may have noticed because I emphasized it earlier. And, and I've, never, I've never spoken to a person that's noticed this before. But there's something kind of strange about this story. Now I want to go back in Ruth chapter number 1. 
And I want to begin in there in verse number, verse number six. Look at verse number six. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now, if you've noticed, and, and maybe you guys have noticed, maybe, maybe you haven't, but I've, I've listened to people preach, preach about this. If you notice, they all, they all started journeying together. And originally, Naomi planned on her daughters going with her. Because if you notice how it's worded even, it says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Now look at verse 7 also. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. So it says it a couple of times. And watch this. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So the plan for all of them already was, we're going to the land of Judah. So while they're on their way, when they're in, in, in the midst of their journey, wherever they stop and have to stay or whatever's you know, happening, maybe they're staying, there's another town that they're staying somewhere. That's when Naomi actually says to her, says to her both of her daughters-in-law, you know, to turn around and at that point to go back to Moab. They're already journeying. Has anybody ever noticed that before? You know, not a lot of people normally, I've never, I've listened to, you know, preaching. I've listened to people preach through the, you know, the chapter uh, one of Ruth. And I've heard people just preach on the story of Ruth. And I've never have heard anybody uh, point that out before, but it's very interesting. So they're actually, the plan from the beginning was for them to go. Now, I have a couple of, of, of reasons why I believe that I think that she, that she, uh, that she stopped them. Now, this is just pure speculation. You know, I'm not, I can't be sure of this, but there's a few things about her language that I thought was kind of strange in the first place. I always thought it was very strange that Naomi says unto Ruth and unto Orpah for, for them to go back unto their people and unto their gods. Did anybody ever think that that's strange before? Like, she's like telling them, like, go back unto the, your people and unto your gods. Like, I always thought that was weird. Why would she be coercing them into going back? Why wouldn't she, her daughters-in-law that she loves... You know, why wouldn't she be trying to encourage them to serve the Lord? Why wouldn't she be trying to tell them to serve God? I always thought that that was a strange, you know, statement. And I'll tell you one reason why I think she may be doing this. Because the nation of Israel is very strict about people coming into the nation and actually becoming a Jew or becoming an Israelite, embracing, you know, the laws of God. Because there are laws implemented in place that you can't worship other gods. There are laws implemented in place that you cannot take the name of the Lord in vain. And there's actually a time where a man takes the name of the Lord in vain. Do you know what nation he's of? I'm pretty sure he was of a, uh, of a Moabitish descent. He takes the name of the Lord in vain and he's put to death. And he's of the Moabites. I'm almost positive. So we can see that it's real serious when you, when you become a part of this nation... You better make sure that you are going to follow the commandments and that you are going to be following the laws of God. Does everyone understand kind of what I'm getting at right now? And I think the closer that they get to Judah and the closer that they get to Bethlehem Judah, I believe that Naomi might start getting nervous now. And, and, and that's why she makes the statement to, in a way, maybe test them or to see whether they are serious or whether to see whether they're, you know, they're going to be serving the right God when they get there. She's like, go back unto your people and unto your God. And then what is, what, what is it that allows you know, Ruth to stay with her? What does she say? Your people shall be my people and your God my God. So she knows like, hey, when we get there, you know, she's not going to be doing anything crazy, right? And you'll notice when they arrive, look down at verse number, look down at verse number 19. You know, it says, so they went, so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? Now, I, wonder, I, I would say I'm sure that one of the reasons why it's all moved about, about you know, everyone's uh, in uproar, they're all talking about it, is because not only is Naomi coming back, but she's bringing this Moabitish woman with her. And very oftentimes people will act weird, and the Jews throughout history have been even they took it to an all new level where they looked down upon anyone that's not of their nation and they treated people poorly. And I think that that could have possibly have also played an effect or played a reason or a factor, played a factor in why she's like kind of hesitant. Because in the beginning, she planned on them coming with them. She planned on both are coming with her, both of them coming with her. But then once they get close, something made her nervous. Something made her stop. Something made her think like, hey, you know, 
and you better make sure, and that's what I believe, it's that she's thinking, you better make sure when you come here you're going to be serving God. And you know what? What did the one girl, what did the, the Orpah do? It says she returned back under, and, and this, is, this is, of course, Naomi's words. She says she went back under her people and under her gods. You know, I don't know. You know, you, there's no way you could know whether Naomi, like, actually went back and started serving those other gods. I'm sorry, Orpah went back and actually started serving those other gods. You don't know that. But, you know, the Bible mentions the gods of the Moabites in the book of Judges when the Moabites would conquer them, when God would give them into the hands of the Moabites, like when Eglon, the big fat guy that gets stabbed by the dagger. Everybody know what I'm talking about? He was the king. That was He was of Moab in the book of Judges when they conquered the Israelites for a period of time. And it tells you, I believe at that exact time, it talks about just in reference to the gods of the Moabites. That I'm referring here, you know, back under the gods of the Moabites, right? It's kind of like it's kind of like people that maybe marry in like they're Catholic and then they marry, you know, like an independent Baptist and they've been Catholic for 25 years and they marry an independent Baptist and they go to church with that person for years. Maybe they just go to an evangelical church or whatever and you think that they've converted unto, you know, Christianity. They've been saved. They, you know, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But then maybe afterwards they just go back. And then they tell you, like, I did that for my husband. Maybe that's what went on. Maybe Orpah actually was not serving the Lord. Maybe that's why she ended up going back. But you know what you know? You can tell here that Ruth, you know, she said, your people's my people and your God is my God. Notice the identification with the people ultimately is rooted in God. The identification of the Moabites was rooted in their gods. And, and the reason why Ruth wanted to go with Naomi was because of the Lord. And how can you tell that she's not, in, you know, she's not being insincere? It's because the ne very next statement, she's making a vow to the Lord. The very next statement right after that. You know, she says, the Lord do so to me and more also. So look at that, uh, that next verse. That's actually where we were, verse 18, or 19. We j we'll read that one more time. So they went, so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? Verse 20, and she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Another question for everybody. Does anybody know when the word Mara was used one other time in the Bible? It's only one other time. It's used one other time. It's spelled differently. Does anybody know the difference in the spelling? H. There's an H on the end. Exactly. Mara with an H on the end. And it's when they're traveling for the 40 years in the wilderness, and they come unto a, you know, a water, it says... And it says that the waters were very bitter, right? The waters were very bitter. Just like right here, it says the Lord had dealt very bitterly with me. And then the people start striving and complaining with God. And then God's like, okay, cut down a tree and throw it in there. And the waters are sweet. Obviously, you know, it's, it's a miracle because it's God, of course. But they, they called the, the waters there Mara. It's spelled with an H. Because it means bitter. Now, I don't know what Naomi means in Hebrew, but I'm guessing that it means something along the lines of, like, blessed or something along. I looked it up and it says pleasant. I mean, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't know that for a fact. I looked it up and it says pleasant, but I'm guessing that it means something along. And that's basically what pleasant means anyway. Something good. That's what ble blessed means, like something pleasant, something good. You're having good things happen to you. And so that would make sense because she's saying, don't call me, Mom. Don't call me Naomi. Like, don't call me blessed because... I'm not blessed because I don't have anything. She says, I can't, I, you know, I left full and now I'm coming back empty. And I think about this too. Notice her perception is different. Think about that. Now when she comes back, now, you know, she, re she really realizes how much she had before. She really now looking back, she realizes how good that she had it. When they left for a famine, they're like, man, we got to go. We got to get out of here. We don't have much money. You know, our finances are low. You know, we don't have much food. But then when she comes back, then she, she realizes, you know what, when I left, I was full. You know, when I left, I didn't really need to leave. When I left, you know, I, you know, I did actually have a lot. And then, when I, now that I've come back, now I don't have anything. Now I'm empty. What was the reason? Because they were out of God's will. That's the reason why. That's the reason why she even realizes that. She says that right here, the Almighty hath dealt very bitter, bitterly with me. What did she say before that? I feel bad for you guys. I feel bad for you, Orpah. I feel bad for you, Ruth. Because the Lord, you know, because the Lord's hand is stretched out against me. Saying that there's judgment against me. And why? Because she should have never, they should have never have left in the first place. Why did they do that? Because they started trusting in 
themselves. They started thinking that, you know, the decisions that they make are going to fix their lives. They started leaning upon... It's the same reason why Abram left the land in the first place. Why? A famine arose, and he goes down to Egypt. He goes down into the world. It's always a picture of, like, returning back to your old life. It's a picture of the flesh. Never understand what I'm saying? You've heard that before, Egypt being a picture of the world. He goes there. Do you know, do you know the other time where someone sojourns? And, and, and the, there's two times before this that it that takes place in the Bible. Uh, there's one other time. Does anybody know? Lot. What's that? Lot. Lot. No, 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 no. They, not because of a famine. There's one. Well, maybe, maybe it does actually there. I think you are right. The other time. No, no, it's not because of that. That isn't because of a famine. The other time that someone sojourns because of a famine is when they go to Egypt when, and when uh, Joseph is sold into slavery. And why didn't you know they go down to Egypt then too? And then, did it, did it end well? No, it ended up turning into, you know, 430 years of slavery. So notice, everybody, a, a problem arises and you're like, oh, my life is just so horrible. I have no money. I have, my, I have, you know, we have no food. You know, nothing is going well. And you know what you end up doing is you start putting that as your priority and then you leave the people of God or you leave God's will or you get out of church, whatever it may be. And then you realize, oh man, it wasn't, you know, it actually wasn't as bad as I thought that it was. It actually wasn't near as bad as I thought that it was, that it was going. And that's exactly what happened with them. They ended up leaving the land. They ended up leaving Israel. They ended up leaving, you know, the covenant that they had made unto God. And they went and lived among the heathen. And then Naomi and them are punished because of it. Naomi and them are, they're, they're given, you know, you know, the, the, her husband dies. I mean, it's horrible. Her husband dies. And how do we apply this? Don't get out of church. It doesn't matter what church you go to. Just go to church. Stay in God's will. You say, what is God's will? Is it for me to go to a particular church? No, it's to stay in church. It's right. to stay serving God. It, the, God's will is, is in this Bible. You, know, you need to read your Bible. You need to go soul winning. You need to pray. You need to follow the commandments of God. This is a picture of people straying away from God's will. What did they say in the beginning? We're just going to go and we're just going to sojourn there. Now, how long did it last? Did they sojourn there? Did they stay there for a short period of time? No, they stayed there for a very long time. They stayed out of church for a very long time. They stayed out of God's will for a very long time. And did it end well for them? It didn't. So what, what do you learn from them? What do you learn from the mistakes that they made? Stay in God's will. Stay in God's will. Stay in church. Whatever church it is you go to, stay in church. Keep soul winning. Keep reading your Bible. Keep praying. Keep doing all the commandments that God has for you. No matter where you are, no matter what church you go to, stay in God's will. Keep reading there. Look at verse 20. We'll read it one more time. She says, and she said unto them, call me not Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. That's why I say Naomi may mean something like, like blessing or something. It, it would make sense because she's saying, don't call me Naomi because things aren't good. They're bad. Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. She says in verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me? And she says it again, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Verse 22, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And then it says, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you, dear God, uh, for uh, just the institution of the church, dear Lord. We thank you, dear God, for your for um, putting your will down in a book, dear Lord, and uh, just telling us what your commandments are and what you would have us to do. Dear Lord, we love you so much. Just help us to, uh, no matter where we are, just to serve you, dear Lord God. No matter where we are in, in our lives, at what phase we are in our life, no matter where we are, you know, geographically, anywhere on this planet, just please just put a desire, a burning desire and zeal in our hearts to continue to serve you uh, until the day that we die. Make a covenant just as, as, uh, as Ruth made, uh, that she was not going to leave uh, Naomi and she was going to stay with her and her people and she was going to stay with her God and that was going to be also her God as in Ruth's God. We love you so much and just be with us, dear Lord God, and bless us and bless all the families that are here tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.